So my name is Ana. Um, I'm from Siena, which is a Portuguese NGO that is currently working with several of these amazing people and amazing NGOs here. Um, we are very, 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 very glad that we are hosting this webinar with Rise Up and with Cis at Risk. So I would like to thank you all for joining us. Um, you have noticed by now that you cannot um, uh, turn on your mics or your cameras. This is the webinar feature of Zoom. Uh, but even said that, you can always participate and give us your comment or your suggestion in the Q&A box. You should find it below in your screen right next to, to raising your hand. You can raise your hand, uh, but, um, but we will kindly ask you to, to leave your comments and questions in the Q&A uh, section. Other things that are going to happen here. So as you notice, this is being recorded. We are going to use it. We are going to use this recording to, to send it to other people all around the world. I know that some of you uh, are in very different time zones from me at least. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good night to everyone. Um, and uh, we also we we will also also have this this opportunity of you you know sending questions to us. We will do our best to to answer these questions. Uh, with me, I have Tiago from Cisatrice. Can I have Renata? Renata, she's from Rise Up, and she's she's going to be the one introducing all of you to our uh, all our, of our great speakers. Uh, all of this um, event is going to be organized in English. So if you are okay with that, just leave your audio in the original position. We are going, going to have only one presentation that's going to be in Portuguese. In that case, in the case you don't speak Portuguese or you don't understand Portuguese during that time, you will have a translation, um, an interpretation in this case, so you don't have to do anything unless you can hear our interpreter, but I, I, I think you will be able to hear him. So let's start and thank you once again for being here. We thought it would be a good idea to start this webinar with a polling. Uh, so we, I will send. I will make sure that you can see this poll. I think you can. I don't know if the speakers can answer it, uh, but if you could, please, I, I don't think again, yeah, but if you could, please um, answer these, these questions, these two questions. So the first is, when did you first hear about the deep sea? Not necessarily deep sea mining, but when did you first hear about the deep sea? And then where are you uh, watching us? Where are you from? Where are you based? And where can we find you? I would also take this moment to uh, kindly ask you if you could please put your uh, the entity that you work for or that you are representing in your name, I mean, after your name, and then the country where you are uh, watching us. We know that we have a lot of people from all around the world, so it would be really good if we could um, have this information. You can do that right after answering these two questions. I'm giving it a bit more time. I can see that not everyone answered. <laughs> So I see that we have a hand being raised. So Samantha, if you would like to share your uh, your thoughts on the Q and A session um, box, we will gladly read it and try to address it. Okay, we have seventy percent of answers. So I think I'm going to close this, and I will share the results with you. I think it's very interesting in order for us to understand where we are being watched. Can you see this? You can, right? Okay, cool. So um, we don't have, I mean, okay, we have some people that have only heard about the deep sea during this year. That's completely okay. <laughs> you come in time still. Um, and then I can see that we have a lot of people from Europe right now, and we have at least people from all around the world. So that's cool from every continent. So that's, 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 that's very nice. Um, and again, if you can put your country uh, in front of your name, that would also be uh, cool. So I'm going to stop this sharing and I will hand it over to Renata so that she can start by introducing our speakers. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you, Sienna, and thank you, CIS at Risk, to organize this webinar together with uh, Rise Up. Uh, I'm Renata Fleck. I'm from Rise Up for, for the Ocean. 
Uh, and to the ones that uh, don't know what is Rise Up, uh, we are organized around the Rise Up Blue Call to Action, which is a text that set priority actions to safeguard the oceans. Um, and actually I highlight a part of our call to action that it resonate with our webinar today, which is basically uh, empowering and support uh, coastal uh, people and communities and speed to transition to a circular economy and sustainable economy by stopping any further development of new activities which harm the ocean health, such as seabed mining. Uh, so Rise Up is a blue call to action that it's signed by more than 500 organizations and it was thinking about these organizations and the communities that we decide to organize this webinar that actually turned out to be a very good success. I'm happy to see so many continents involved here today. Um, and we have the speakers and different voices also from all over the world. So thank you very much for our speakers as well and the participants. So. I would like to start the webinar uh, calling Marie Louise Ab 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 Abshengen. I don't know if I'm talking correct. Uh, sorry, Marie Louise, um, you can correct me. Uh, Marie Louise is from the German uh, NGO Forum and Environment Development. She's the policy officer on sustainable development. And she will talk in eight minutes about a big picture of what is deep sea mining. Uh, the floor is yours, Marie-Louise. Thank you very much. I will start sharing my screen. I hope you can see the full screen. Super. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I would like to give you the big picture of deep sea mining. What is it about and why do we even talk about it? But before we look into the oceans, I would actually like to start somewhere else. Um, let's see how I can move this, sorry. Okay, um, let's start in a museum. So all of you have probably heard about the activists from Just Stop Oil that threw tomato soup at a Van Gogh picture or better, so it's glass cover. The activists were using this act of civil disobedience to talk about the climate crisis and the urgency for fossil fuel phase out. And what followed was a global outcry about the value of art and the limits of protests and a discussion of whether or not it is this would keep people from getting engaged in the climate movement because presumably these actions were too drastic. And this whole discussion made me really angry, to be honest, because of the deep hypocrisy in this criticism. Because in the end, it was about a lot of things, but the rationale of the protest itself, and was clearly hijacked by those who have never been interested in combating the climate crisis at all. And this is a common playbook for those profiting from our current economic model. And our lives are and should not surprise us. What made me angry was them pretending to care about the preservation of something valuable for the whole of humankind. Because take a moment, take a moment to think about all the things, all the art, all the beautiful nature, all the cultural practices that we have already lost. Due to environmental destruction, due to colonialism, due to climate change, due to greed. All that is lost to humankind, to us as people or to our cultures. Take a moment to think about all that we have already lost. And now imagine if we had a chance, we as people, we as societies and we as economies, if we had to have a chance to do it differently, to do it differently for once to say no to one of the biggest environmental destructions yet to come, to simply not do it. And we have this chance with deep sea mining. Since the 19th century, we have known that there are different forms of rock with mineral resources on the ocean floor of the deep sea. 
These rock formations come in different forms and include small percentages of metals such as copper or nickel or iron or manganese or cobalt. And all of these rock formations are incredibly old. It took millions of years to form them. One of these deposits could be in the shape of black smoke smokers, these chimneys, um, these rock formations that you can see here. Or they can be in the shape of manganese nodules, which are rocks about as big as a fist or a potato that are scattered loosely in the sediment of the deep ocean floor. And since the 1970s, there has been interest to mine these minerals. The biggest obstacle was the lack of technology and the fact that these deposits were much more difficult to reach than the deposits on land, which could be mined easier and much cheaper, of course. But with the tremendous increase in the use of metals worldwide, the interest in deep sea deposits has grown again. In a way, though, we are still stuck in the 1970s, because back then and up until the 1980s and 90s, when governments were negotiating the law of the sea convention that would form the international legal basis for deep sea mining, when these negotiations were happening, the general understanding was that there was no life on the deep sea floor, which by now we know is not true. In fact, we still have only discovered about 5% of the deep sea and about 0.0001% of the deep sea floor. But still we know there's an extraordinary amount of life down there. In fact, these pictures were taken by scientists at the site of a potential deep sea mining operation of manganese nodules in the Pacific Ocean only in 2019. If mining were to take place, all of this would be gone. In the last couple of years, there has been widespread research on the impact of deep sea mining, including revisiting the site of a first scientific experiment to mine manganese nodules which was done in the 1970s by German scientists. And this picture shows the site of this mining experience and was taken 50 years after the mining test has taken place. We can clearly still see the marks of the mining equipment. We can see that life that was there before has not returned at all. Deep sea mining is nothing but strip mining of the oceans. It will rip out the rocks that were home to incredibly rare and mostly unknown creatures. It will disturb and destroy ecosystems, which we don't even know their function of the oceans yet. And it will alter and impact the ocean floor forever because what has grown over a million years will never return. In the international waters alone, there are about or over 30 mining sites. States together with corporations can apply for exploration licenses, which means they can research what mineral deposits can be found in these areas, how much they would be worth, what kind of mining equipment can be used and how it would impact the environment. And currently international negotiations are happening that will define under what rules and regulation mining could take place. If the negotiations go ahead as planned, deep sea mining in the high seas could start as early as next year or the year after that. And with a potential mining license of over 30 years, each one of these mining sites could be the size of New York City. And if mining were to take place in all of the license areas currently under exploration in the high seas, mining in the deep sea could happen in an area the size of Mongolia. And additionally, there are plans to mine the ocean floor in national waters of Pacific Island states, which have similar rock formations, but are much, much closer to the, to the shore. And this threatens not only to further impact the marine environment in the Pacific, but would have great impact on human rights as well. If deep sea mining goes ahead, it would be the biggest mining operation of human history. 
you will hear more about the details of the environment impact um, as well as the nature of these negotiations in this webinar. And you will also hear on how we can collectively stop deep sea mining from ever taking place. I would thus like to leave you with one more wonder of the deep sea. This fish, this rainbow colored fish that will change its gender throughout its lifetime was just discovered in the deep waters of the Maldives. And it is yet another example, if not a symbol of how much we as humans are connected to nature and can learn so much from the oceans. And it is another symbol of what we cannot lose again. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Can I uh, add something? Unfortunately, as some of you have noticed, and uh, really unfairly, um, we forgot to paste Africa as an option. So I'm so sorry. Uh, in the in the in the poll uh, that we did. So I'm going to redo this, and it's a good thing because we have more people now. So I'm terribly sorry. I'm going to ask this again. These are data that are interesting for us and for the for the. Um, you know, for, for the webinar and for us to understand where people are from. So I have, okay, I think I can share this now. You can see this, I think you can, yeah. Okay, so please, and I will also answer because we had a question here asking um, how many people were here. So we have 40 people participating and I can let you know in the end how many of you answer and you will all, all be able to see where people are from yeah this is increasing the number of participation cool better than last time obviously <laughs> i'm sorry for that we have 80 percent of participation until now okay i can share the results now so as someone was asking we have 41 participants right now and uh, we have uh, people, 80% of those answered this. So you can see that we still have a uh, large rep representativeness from Europe, but still we have people from all around the world, which is very nice. And I think that this shows us that we are all worried in a lot of places. Um, so this is actually good because our, this is actually good because our, our next speaker just arrived right in time. <laughs> and this is the, um, the, um, the presentation is going to be in Portuguese, so you don't need to do anything. If you are in the original audio, I think it should be fine. If you want to listen to Portuguese, just switch it to Portuguese and you'll be able to, to hear it also. Shirley, hi. Hola. Uh, yes, Shirley. Thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you for answering the, the questions. Hola, bom dia. Bom dia. Olá, Shirley. Bom dia. Obrigada. Um, Shirley. Um... Só, um, só, um, só um momento aqui, que eu estou com a, a internet um pouco lenta, mas espera aí, só um momentinho. Tá Deixa bem. eu só melhorar aqui, rapidinho. Tá bem. Isso. Eu, ah. vou, eu vou te apresentando okay. em inglês também, pode ser? Agora. Pode. Ai, ah, pode. já está. Então... So, Shirley is, uh, Shirley, she's from the Krenak Institute. Uh, Shirley Ju Kurnel Krenak Institute. And she's part of the articulation of national women, indigenous women fighters for the ancestrality from Brazil. And she will be talking to us why it's important to stop deep sea, deep sea mining to happen because she felt uh, on her skin what happened when uh, go, something go wrong with a in a mining area in Brazil. So she will give her reports from directly from Len. Uh, muito obrigada, Shirley. Só para explicar, nós vamos ter uma interpretação uh, do que você vai estar falando. Mm -hmm. E depois vamos poder uh, também dar esse webinar e uh, traduzir ele para o português também, porque agora a gente só conseguiu fazer a interpretação do português para o inglês. Posso, uh, eu não sei se tu está... Renata, uh, desculpa, uh, a Chile, portanto, para o, para o João poder uh, traduzir, a Chile tem que, tem que selecionar o português. Sim. A Chile has to like português, sim. Yeah. Na parte da interpretação, Shirley, se tu for ver ali embaixo, no, 
tu tem que uh, selecionar uh, o português, que daí uh, no, o nosso colega vai conseguir fazer a interpretação. Ah, onde está isso aqui? Aí embaixo, tá vendo? Onde tem uh, levantar a mão, que ah, uh, interpre... onde está escrito interpretação. Deixar Isso, tem os participantes, como de tela, levantar a mão, uh, que, uh, o que e e, que é as perguntas, e aí a interpretação. Aqui, peraí. Português. Isso, aí tu seleciona português. Selecionado. Olha aí. Sim. Agora, e se tu puder falar alto, porque daí o pessoal escuta, quem, puder, quem quiser escuta a tua voz e quem não entender o português, escuta, a, a, um, escuta também a, a tradução. Só para tu ter uma ideia, nós temos pessoas da, da Oceania, da África, da, do Sul da América, do Norte da América e da Europa aqui no, nos escutando. Então, ah, ok. Pode, pode começar, Shirley, obrigada. É... Bom dia, Ererê, Inhauit. Você que vai me traduzir? Não, vai ser o um colega que está que traduzindo aqui. Ah, ele traduz, né? Aí, sem a gente escutar, tá certo. <risos> Ai, gente, é uma bagunça esse negócio, né? Mas vamos lá. So, good morning, everyone. Let's go. Ererê, na minha língua. Ererê, my language, means good morning. Everything that's good, everything that's possible. Ererê. Sempre a gente começa com essa palavra. É, antes de qualquer momento na nossa vida, né? Onde a gente está nos espaços de fala. Então, era ré sempre para todo mundo. Meu nome é Shirley Dukurnan Krenak. Dukurnan significa espírito que não envelhece. Está sempre novo, está sempre pronto para seguir com a missão. E Krenak significa cabeça. Krenak então, Krenak, cabeça, né? isso aqui, centro da cabeça na Terra. E nós somos aqui da região do leste de Minas Gerais, com a central de Belo Horizonte, e, e somos em torno de 600 Krenak, não somos nem mil, devido a toda a chacina que aconteceu desde o processo da colonização até os tempos atuais. E para quem quiser saber mais sobre o meu povo, depois pode me chamar no privado, que a gente pode conversar tranquilamente. E nós residimos aqui desde que mundo é mundo, sempre fomos deste, desta localidade. E somos conhecidos na história do mundo inteiro, principalmente na Europa, como Botocudos, do Vale do Rio Doce. Mas Botocudo é um nome pejorativo e eu detesto, não gosto. Porque é o um nome que deram para o meu povo, os colonizadores deram para o meu povo, né? um apelido, um bullying, né? e eu não gosto. People, and we don't like. I like to be called Borum, which means the essence of humanity. The essence... Então, Borum Krenak. Né? Então, Chile e Jukurnan Borum. Gosto de ser chamada assim. Então, para começar a nossa apresentação de uma forma histórica e totalmente é, correta. O meu povo, no, no longo do processo da história, ele passou por diversos momentos dentro dessa linha de tempo de resistência. né? Desde a questão da colonização, invasão, estupros, perdas das terras, é, violação... É, com crimes que aconteciam de rapto de crianças, câmaras técnicas que eram realizadas na Europa, que levavam o meu povo para estudos, né? que na época a gente era utilizado como rato de laboratório. Então, a nossa região aqui foi muito, muito violentada com esse tipo de atrocidade, não é mesmo? Então, a gente yes. tem uma história... So people have a story with Germans, with Portuguese, with Dutch, Americans. And in that historical process of resistance, we have faced those realities. Em 1915, 1917, com a construção da linha férrea aqui 
passou no nosso estado de Minas Gerais. E esse processo de construção da linha férrea veio arrebentando ainda mais com o nosso povo, porque a gente não aceitava de forma alguma que essas ações que se dizem progressos é, viessem arrebentando a nossa terra, abrindo ela ao meio, colocando ferro no chão. É, e... Só um pouquinho, deixa eu te interromper, é, para ter certeza que escolheu a opção português. Tenho. Escolheu. Escolhi. Tá. O Renato está, está funcionando. Tá funcionando. Então tá. Porque é só porque eu escuto no chat. Tá? Me desculpa interromper. Pode continuar. Uhum. E no processo dessa, dessa implementação da linha férrea, aqui no nosso estado, que a linha férrea pega de Belo Horizonte até o Espírito Santo, vieram também muitas mortes por não, por, pelo meu povo não ter aceitado isso. Então, dentro do processo de luta contra a mineração, o meu povo já tem mais de 300 anos que luta contra a mineração. Dentro desse processo do ativismo que todo mundo conhece, que hoje as pessoas estão fazendo parte desse movimento, o meu povo já é ó, muito bem entendido da situação. A gente sabe muito bem o que é lutar contra a mineração e o que é, né, é ter essa, essa, essa ação presente 24 horas por dia na nossa vida. Então, para vocês que estão nesse webinar, que estão vindo aí com essa vontade mesmo, que assim eu espero, de lutar contra todas essas atrocidades que a mineração está trazendo para o nosso país e para todos os países, eu espero que vocês tenham muita vontade de viver e muita vontade de lutar, porque tem muita gente que começa a luta e já fala que está cansado, e o meu povo já luta mais de 200 anos, e eu ainda não cansei, e nunca vou cansar. Então, é só para dizer para vocês aí, é, do outro lado do mundo, que lutar contra... Do outro lado do mundo, que lutar contra mining não é apenas... Sai já dizer que está cansado, não. Que aí, por favor, então não, nem entre na briga. Nem entre. Porque se não for para ter vontade é, de fazer ações positivas em prol da mãe terra e de tudo que nela há de sagrado, é melhor nem começar. Porque eu sou uma pessoa que, quando eu estou na luta, eu vou até o fim. E eu estou aqui para isso. Até porque o meu corpo é terra e o que corre dentro de mim é água. Não sei o corpo de vocês, mas o meu é apenas isso. Tudo que eu como vem da terra, então por que, que eu não, sou, não vou ser terra? Não é mesmo? Então, é só para vocês terem entendimento do que é lutar contra a mineração. E aqui, é, dentro desses processos todos, a mineração também fez parte, né? a companhia Vale, né? porque a Vale é, é majoritária de muitas empresas de mineração. Né? Então, muita gente fica aí falando sobre a, a Vale, BHP, Samarco, Anglo América, muitas outras empresas de mineração, mas assim a gente tem que falar de quem realmente é dono dessas que ficam embaixo. né? Geralmente, a Vale é majoritária de muitas empresas, muitas, mas muitas, no mundo todo. Então, quando a gente tiver que bater na mineração, a gente tem que bater lá em cima. Nada de ficar lutando com terceirizado, não, porque, sinceramente, isso é uma perda de tempo do caramba. E eu não gosto de perder tempo com isso, não. É... E aqui, em 5 de novembro de 2015, além de todos esses problemas históricos, geno... quase genocídio do meu povo, que veio também com a construção da linha férrea, como se não bastasse todas essas desgraças que a mineração trouxe para o meu povo, nós ainda tivemos que enfrentar, em 5 de novembro de 2015, a morte de mais de 700 quilômetros de rio de água doce, que nós, na nossa língua, chamamos de Uatu. Uatu significa o rio que corre. Só que agora a gente fala o rio que corria no passado, porque agora tudo que a gente fala sobre o rio, a gente se fa fala agora no passado, porque agora, no presente, ele está totalmente morto. Né? Nós temos aí toda a tabela periódica jogada nesse rio. E mais de 3 milhões de, de pessoas, de famílias, foram atingidas por esse crime do dia 5 de novembro de 2015, que aconteceu o rompimento da barragem, que eles falam que é de Mariana, mas não é de Mariana. É tanta burrice também 
é, essa barragem estourou em Bento Rodrigues, atingindo Corgo do Feijão e atingindo Mariana. Então, como é na região de Mariana, todo mundo fala barragem de Mariana. Mas, na, na verdade, não é barragem de Mariana, é a barragem da Vale. É a barragem do, de BHP, é a, ba, a barragem de, da Samarco, né? Então, atingiu todo esse rio e esse rio corta toda a minha terra, todo, todo o nosso território, ele passa no meio. E a gente tinha uma convivência com esse rio 24 horas por dia. Tudo que a gente fazia vinha do rio. Lavar roupa, vasilha, tomar banho, é, ensinar nossas crianças a ter uma coletividade dentro d'água, pesca, alimentação, tudo vinha do rio. Ah, poxa, mas e aí? E aí que hoje nós não temos conta. Agora tudo vem de supermercado, de cidade, né? A gente agora está passando por um problema muito grande de depressão, né? de tristeza, perdemos muitos anciões tristes porque viu o rio morto. Todas as espécies de peixe foram atingidas nesse crime, né? porque ele aconteceu na época da piracema. E a piracema é um tempo em que os peixes estão se renovando, novas vidas estão vindo nos rios. E peixes que na época estavam quase extintos, estavam voltando e agora nós não temos nem vestígio desses peixes mais. Acabou. Tem nada. Ah, mas e aí? Como é que é feito toda a coletividade do povo? Ué, como? Não é feito mais. A gente não tem mais o contato com o rio. Geralmente, quando o meu parente agora quer tomar um banho de rio, ele toma banho numa lagoa. Ou então, na piscina com água, com cloro. Ou então sai do território e vai procurar um território de outro parente para poder se refrescar ou procurar um rio. E agora estão indo mais para o mar, né? tomar banho no mar. Ah, mas aí está um perigo também, porque o crime de 2015 também atingiu o mar, que foi para as águas do mar do Espírito Santo. Olha aí. E todo dia essa lama uma química cai no mar. Passa todos os dias no nosso rio e cai no mar. Então, a mineração no mar já está acontecendo, né? Já, isso já foi um, uma deixa. Ó, tipo, a gente pode minerar no mar já, porque né, tem muita gente já que já está acostumando com o que está sendo jogado no mar, então por que, que a gente não pode minerar no mar? Ninguém liga para o mar, o mar é infinito, o mar é muito grande. É mesmo? Então, a gente precisa agora é ter entendimento do que esses crimes estão trazendo é, de forma cruel e, e ampliar isso para que as pessoas tenham entendimento do que se trata. Porque quando eu vou para a Europa para falar do que aconteceu aqui na minha terra, todo mundo chega e fala, oh, nós não sabíamos, mas será mesmo que não sabia ou que não quis saber? É, 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 é isso que eu fico tentando entender, sabe? Às vezes a gente está nesses movimentos ambientais na Europa, fora do Brasil, participando de tudo, e há um falseamento de ações ambientais muito grande diante das pessoas também, não só dos governos, mas das pessoas. Então, para que a gente possa avançar nessa luta contra a mineração, as pessoas precisam ter entendimento do que é isso e o que isso traz para a sociedade e para o mundo inteiro. Porque, senão, a briga se torna algo, assim, perdido, sabe? Então, a gente precisa comover as pessoas, levar isso para as pessoas, para que elas tenham entendimento do que é, do que está acontecendo aqui no Brasil. Todos os biomas do Brasil estão sendo prejudicados com ações de mineração. Ah, mas Chile e todos os biomas... Ah, mas aqui fora do Brasil a gente só sabe que existe a Amazônia. Pois é, não é mesmo? Só a Amazônia. Todo mundo fala Amazônia, Amazônia, Amazônia. E eu estou aqui, na Mata Atlântica, sofrendo com o problema da mineração. E todo mundo só fala na Amazônia. A gente precisa ter entendimento de falar sobre a mineração de uma forma muito coletiva. De uma forma muito coletiva. Porque não é só a Amazônia que está sofrendo com problemas de avanço contra garimpo, mineração nos rios, Rio Negro, 
é, 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 e toda a, a, a cidade de Belém, Santarém, totalmente poluída com a questão do garimpo. Nós temos aí o Pantanal, nós temos aí a, a Caatinga, nós temos o Pampa, nós temos Mata Atlântica, nós temos o Cerrado. Nós temos todos esses biomas que estão sendo totalmente é, é, arrebentados com o agronegócio e com as questões da mineração. Então, se é para trabalhar, se é para pegar firme com a luta contra a mineração, a gente precisa de base. A gente precisa que as pessoas da base tenham um entendimento do que é isso, sobre mineração no mar. Quantos povos vão ser atingidos? Quais são as cidades? Quais são os povos, comunidades tradicionais que vivem do mar nessa região ao qual tudo isso vai acontecer? E aí a gente precisa estar conversando com essas pessoas, porque as empresas de mineração, elas saem dentro dessas comunidades tradicionais pegando os chefes, coaptando os chefes, coaptando os chefes de associação, os chefes da comunidade. É assim que elas fazem. E vão martelando, martelando até cooptar essas lideranças para que essas lideranças fiquem a favor do empreendimento ao qual elas querem fazer no mar e também fora do mar. Então, para a gente lutar contra a mineração, a gente precisa de ter base ter povo, ter ações é, 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 de, de propostas, de entendimentos, para que essas comunidades saibam do que está sendo promovido por todos esses mais de 100 países que estão aí procurando né, acessibilidade e autorização para que essa desgraça ambiental ocorra no mar. Até porque eles já devem ter um pouco de ciência de como fazer isso, né? porque tem a questão do petróleo, tem a questão aí da energia aélica, como é que fala? Eu esqueço o jeito de falar, a, e, a, a eólica, a eólica. No meio do mar, a gente viaja de avião de um país para o outro, a gente vê aquele tanto de robô no meio do mar lá, pensa bem, fica imaginando, fala, meu Deus, eu espero que nunca aconteça nenhum tsunami muito grande para arrancar tudo isso e jogar nas cidades. Eu espero que isso não aconteça, porque a poluição, as pessoas estão preferindo plantar metal no mar do que plantar árvore na terra. O que, que é isso? Como, como, como que é? A que ponto a humanidade está chegando? É melhor plantar ferro no mar do que plantar árvore na terra? Olha que absurdo! Então, a gente não está lidando só com a questão da mineração. O mar já está sendo estuprado de uma forma muito violenta. Tá certo, tem um lado positivo desse jeito é, 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 que as pessoas falam é, com a energia eólica, mas e aí, será mesmo que é positivo? Porque quando eu vejo o mar sendo estuprado dessa forma, para mim não é positivo não, que eu vejo metal, ferro enfiado na, na, na essência do mar para poder produzir energia para todo mundo. Mas aí, as árvores produzem isso, gente. As pessoas estão destruindo rios, destruindo florestas e preferindo plantar metal. Então, de que forma a gente precisa se unir né, para levar adiante todo esse processo de luta? Porque lutar contra a mineração não é fácil. Tem que ter pancada, tem que gostar de dar murro na mesa, porque se não for para dar murro na mesa, não entra na briga, não. Fica lá dentro da sua casa pensando que você está fazendo ativismo, sabe? É, eu penso desse jeito. Eu falo com propriedade, bato no peito, porque eu sou uma mulher empoderada nessa merda, dessa luta contra a mineração, tá? Eu sou empoderada pra caralho no que diz respeito à luta contra a mineração. Agora, se for para ficar de oba-oba e boca cheio de farofa, sem querer lutar, eu tô fora. Estou fora mesmo. Ou vem para a luta de um jeito verdadeiro, ou então fica em casa. Porque esse ativismo de proteção ambiental das águas e das terras não é só dos povos indígenas, não. É do povo branco também. E desse povo branco que mais destrói. Nós, povos indígenas, somos apenas 5% da população. Defendemos 80% dessa biodiversidade. Mas e aí? Quem está com a gente? Quem está com a gente? Porque chega na hora do vamos ver que você olha para trás, uh, 
Um tanto de gente virou com massa, a instituição deixou todo mundo, a gente para trás. A gente está ainda aí, ó, fazer parte da cópia agora do Egito. Tinha um tanto de instituição que falava que ia apoiar a luta, que ia apoiar a luta. Quando a gente procura para apoiar, para ajudar a gente com recurso financeiro, para passar e para ocupar esses espaços, para que a gente tenha momento de fala, some todo mundo. Não tem ninguém. Então, also é important to then stand when we have to fight. So when we talk about the need for proposals to restore our e muitos governos internacionais têm essa tem esse problema. Fala, olha, estamos mandando, fazendo tudo pelo Brasil com questão ambiental. Vem aqui então. Vem rodar aqui, vem pisar, vem tomar água do meu rio. Eu faço questão de levar vocês aí na beirada do meu rio, pegar um copo de água e dar para você beber. Quem daí se propõe a beber a água do meu rio? Agora, do jeito que ele está. Mais de um milhão de pessoas já está totalmente doente, com câncer aqui na nossa região, vinda de toda essa desgraça ambiental que a mineração trouxe para a nossa região. E a Vale é tida como as podásticas e trabalhos voltados para a questão ambiental, né, fora do Brasil. Mas é isso, é, o meu recado aqui está dado, eu estou aqui para ajudar, mas para lutar contra a mineração, no que significa mar, a mineração em mar profundo, a gente precisa das bases, eu falo lideranças das comunidades, para que elas participem da próxima reunião, para que vocês possam explicar o que, do que se trata isso, sabe? É... O que, que é mineração em mar profundo? O que, que isso traz? A ciência já falou, já deu resposta a tudo isso? Sim, mas é falseado também. Ela fala, ó, oh, não tem nenhum dos estudos aí que comprove tal, que possa prejudicar ou que vá prejudicar. Mas também não, não fala, ó, oh, não vou fazer isso, porque isso já vai trazer problema demais para a questão ambiental, para a questão climática. Então, até que ponto a gente precisa... É, ter equilíbrio para trabalhar com a tradição, que somos nós, povos tradicionais, com a ciência, que também somos nós, povos tradicionais, e com a tecnologia, que também somos nós, povos tradicionais. Nós temos tudo isso. Nós somos tradição, nós somos ciência, nós somos tecnologia. Né? Então, a única coisa que a gente precisa é de pessoas que queiram realmente lutar sem ter medo de encarar a realidade do das questões que diz respeito à mineração, tanto na água doce quanto na água salgada. É isso. Gratidão. Muito obrigada, Shirley. Muito inspirador e realmente é... eu fico muito feliz que tu pôde, que tu está aqui dando voz e representando e muito empoderada. Eu quero, gostaria que todas as pessoas é... Tenham isso como exemplo e que a gente possa juntos é, né, unir essa força de terra e mar. Muito obrigada mesmo, Shirley. Eu vou falar isso agora em é, passar para o inglês. Yeah, I would like to thank Shirley very much for this very inspiring presentation. Um, and I'm very happy and uh, to see this power, the power of the ancestrality, the power of a woman and an indigenous woman fighting for against uh, mining and raising our voices to, to fight together against uh, the terrestrial and deep sea mining. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, now I want to um, call our next Uh, speaker that is uh, Natalie Lowry uh, that will talk about a bit more in deep about the uh, impacts of specifically deep sea mining. Uh, Laura, uh, Natalie it's from the deep sea mining campaign from Australia and the floor is yours Natalie. Thank you. Great thank you and I just really want to thank Shirley for being in this space as someone who's worked against mining issues for over 20 years, 
and as someone who's worked against BHP, who is complicit in the disaster in your territories and your river, um, I'm very grateful to be in this space with you and even more grateful that you are willing to stand with us against another form of extraction, which is deep sea mining. Um, so before I start, I'd actually really like to acknowledge that um, I'm speaking to you from the unceded traditional lands of the Wurundjeri Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation in Nam, which is commonly known as Melbourne and so-called Australia. They've lived um, on these lands and oceans since time immemorial. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and acknowledge that wherever I walk in so-called Australia, I live and walk on Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander lands and waters. Always will, always will be Aboriginal land. And I just want to add, actually, after hearing um, Shirley, that deep sea mining is a continuation of the colonial project and extractive logic, and particularly in the region of Oceania, which is which is where I'm going to be talking about some of these impacts. So I'm the. Um, oh, is, can you see that at all? It might be work now. Oh, that's not coming up. That's very weird. Can you see that? We can see the PowerPoint presentation, yeah. Can you see all the slides though? No, it's kind of... Oh. Yeah, that's so strange. Let me just get out of it and start again. Mm -hmm. It was working before, of course, but you know how it goes. <laughs> I don't know why that's not working. Anyway, uh, I will just skip to this. I'll just skip here. But the deep sea mining campaign has been working on the issue of um, deep sea mining for 11 years. Um, and we, uh, we have a focus around science advocacy, finance advocacy, and solidarity, particularly with um, Indigenous communities across the Pacific, but also partners in the region and internationally. Um, I think uh, Marie-Louise definitely sort of gave us a bit of an overview of what is deep sea mining. Um, and it has been since the 70s that there's been this growing kind of interest in the vast quantities of uh, metal rich minerals in the deep sea. Uh, currently, there is no operating deep sea mine in the world, but there is this really intense growing interest in exploiting um, our ocean, the deep sea ocean, both in national and international waters. And there's approximately 2 million square kilometers of Pacific Ocean currently under exploration leasehold for deep sea mining. And I wanna note that one of the companies, one of the very big PR pushes of deep sea mining called the Metals Company has already started experimental deep sea mining um, in the ocean floor in the Clarion Clifton zone. In September, the Metals, the Metals Company was given the green light by the International Seabed Authority that Emma will talk to more um, to test its deep sea mining system. Um, and they're currently there right now. So this is an urgent call for people to really understand this issue and know that we really have to come together to stop it before it starts. Um, and this interest uh, for deep sea mining has really risen because of the demand for minerals and metals uh, for high tech applications like our phones and laptops, but also as Shirley was talking about wind turbines solar panels and electric storage batteries for electric vehicles. So the deep sea is becoming a sacrifice zone for the energy transition. And the, the pro deep sea mining industry are really trying to position themselves as, as they have to mine the deep sea for climate action, which as we all know is, is just not really going to be the answer. So the deep sea is defined as around below 200 meters and it's a world of extremes with temperatures, you know, near zero degrees, but there is heaps and heaps of life in the deep sea. And as Marie-Louise talked about, much of it we still don't know or understand. I don't know why my slides aren't showing up. This is a bit disconcerting. Anyway, this is the Clarion and Clifton zone. So this is this area that um, they've got mass exploration, like this 17 exploration licenses, and it's between Hawaii and the coast of Mexico. Uh, and this is massive. Like I think uh, Marie Louise said, it's the size of, could be the size of Mongolia, or you could think of it as almost like the lower half of the United States of America. So if this goes ahead, it will be the largest mining operation the planet has ever seen. Unfortunately, I can't believe you can't see that photo, but that photo is actually of an uh, Indigenous man from New Island province, um, their traditional shark callers. 
So the deep sea mining industry paints the deep sea as like this sort of place with no life. Um, and they, you know, as you can see in this beautiful quote here from Jonathan Messelin, one of our partners in Papua New Guinea, who has been fighting against deep sea mining for over a decade, that they have thousands, tens of thousands of years of connection with their oceans, both traditionally, but also economically and socially. So despite, this is such a shame. I don't know why this is not showing. Can I just stop again? Because it's such a shame because there's some really good visuals in here. And I don't really understand why it's not. Okay, Natalie, do you want us to share your slides to try and share your slides and see what, what you think? Let me just see if I can. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe just do that. I know that Tiago is sharing, no? Yeah, I think it's Tiago. So if you could, Tiago. Uh, yeah, cool. So if you just go down num to number eight, and this is where I'll kind of talk, talk about the impacts. Thanks. Technology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so there are going to be impacts, despite the industry hasn't actually started operating. Um, the science is really showing that there is going to be impacts. Thanks, Tiago. So just here is fine. So there's going to be environmental risks. Um, the deep sea, particularly in the abyssal plains, everything, the time frames are very slow. So, and they're very, it's very biodiverse, these ecosystems, despite the fact we still, you know, there's huge gaps in science. And so disturbance by light, noise, and the tox toxic sediment plumes that will spread over vast areas if mining goes ahead is, could be a real ir irreversible loss of biodiversity and restoration will be near impossible. There's the economic risks. Employment will be minimal. So Pacific Island nations that have sort of signed up to this, they're really just getting peanuts if this industry goes ahead. Uh, economic, uh, economic profitability is, you know, pretty much doubtful. And there's just going to be a lot of impacts on other econ economies like fisheries and tourism and other marine sectors. Um, and also, you know, the seas as a sacrifice zone is just enforcing this continued economic growth at all costs um, and unsustainable consumption and production patterns, which has kind of got us into the crisis that we're in now. And of course, so there's the social risks. There's going to be mass impacts on local communities. And there's a lack of involvement of just the global citizen. When we talk about the clarion Clipperton zone and we talk about international oceans, these are the common heritage of humankind, yet we're not really having a say. Next slide, thanks. So I'm going to focus on um, Blue Peril. We, we, we did a report in 2020, and from that, we created a visual uh, investigation of deep sea mining over the last two to three years using um, modeling, uh, oceanographic modeling. Um, you can start that little video. And so the Blue Peril presents a scientifically robust visualization of how far the impacts of deep sea mining are likely to be for marine ecosystems and Pacific Island communities and economies. It presents modeling using best publicly available data. And it really shows like the plumes. And here's an example of plumes from uh, probably a scientific experiment on the seafloor. So you can see how big they are. If we can just go to the next slide. So Blue Peril, the modeling um, it predicts that in three months, the pollution discharged by the metals company's Tongan license area in the Clarion Clipperton zone um, would reach Hawaii and Kiribati. And this is going to be huge consequences for the health and livelihood of the indigenous peoples and coastal peoples of Hawaii and Kiribati, and also the, these very diverse marine and coastal ecosystems. And there's also going to be liabilities and damages for the fisher folk, commercial fishing industries, tourism, and also for nation states that are trying to be partner into this industry. Next slide, please. And so also one of the predictions is that the, their Nauru license, so another license area within the CCZ, um, in, in 30 years, because these are long how, how long these contracts would run for, um, would destroy the seabed a similar size to the whole of Hawaii. And as I sort of mentioned, and also Marie-Louise mentioned, the Clarion Clipperton Zone or our deep seas are not an ecological desert. It's very unique, and we just don't know enough about it. 
and the mining of these nodules will crush and scrape what is a very soft sort of seafloor. It's going to kill everything in its way. And as Marie Louise has spoken about, there were past sort of uh, tracks in the ocean that still are there 30 years later. So if you're looking at commercial large scale deep sea mining going ahead, we're looking, this is, this is pretty much essentially irreversible in human timeframes. Next, please. And so again, in this Nori license, the sediment cloud and plume, remember this is toxic, it's toxicity. There's still not really even the science around the, about what the toxicity will be or the levels of toxicity. But in 30 days, that would spread over 200 kilometers. And these machines are really massive. Like think of a two-story house, that's how big they are in the deep sea moving along. And so if you were to allow those licenses Licenses to go ahead in the clarion Clifton zone over a 30 year period, the spread of plumes and the pollution would be massive and there would be absolutely thousands of species that would go in extinct and many of them that we may not even know of yet. Next please. So as I said before, this would be the largest mining operation in the world history if it's to go ahead, which is why we all need to stand and make sure it never does go ahead. And it will affect millions of people. Families and communities across the Pacific are already at the front lines of climate change with rising sea levels. Many are relocating from their lands as we speak and other extreme weather events. And we, the oceans are just so much under threat with pollution and plastics and overfishing, acidification, that this is just not an industry that we really need to know. And really just to sort of go back to kind of how what Shirley was, was talking about, you know, science is only now catching up to what Indigenous communities in the Pacific have always known, that we are all connected from the deep sea to coral reefs, to fisheries, from marine creatures, large and small, to human communities. And deep sea mining is going to be an industry that could destroy all that. If you go to the next slide, it's just a 30 second snippet, hopefully it will work, of the Blue Peril video. And it actually shows you the simulation of the plume spread from the Tongan license. So it may be a bit slow, but bear with me because visually it's pretty powerful and you can see the extent of where the plumes from one mine site would go. Wow. Thank you. I think that's the end. But um, yeah, you can go to the link there, blueperil.org, to watch the 16 minute visualization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, this video, it's, it's very good. Uh, I'm I advised everyone to watch the Blue Peril video. Um, it shows very well the impacts of deep sea mining. Um, and now for our next uh, speaker, that uh, it's Emma Wilson from the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Uh, Emma is the policy officer and she will talk about uh, deep sea mining, who is regulating deep sea mining, how this is happening, like these people are just deciding to mine in the middle of the ocean. So Emma, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renata. And first and foremost, thank you so much for everyone uh, who is here today. Thank you for being here. And many thanks also for the Three presentations that have gone before me, um, some really powerful words in there. Thank you. It's been great listening uh, to this. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, okay, can everybody see that? Great. 
Um, so I'll start with a quick introduction. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. We're an organization of over 100 uh, environmental groups, um, and we specialize in campaigning for the protection of the deep ocean. So obviously, deep sea mining is a central focus of, of our work right now. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to change the slide. Yeah. No. <laughs> Maybe we can do as we did previously and could Tiago? Yeah. Yeah, actually that would be that would be good. <laughs> you can do that, Tiago. You have it? Oh, I have to stop showing my screen. Okay, you good? Sorry, bear with. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. And we can go to the next slide. And the next slide. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Um, so today I've been asked to zoom in on the International Seabed Authority, AKA the ISA. Um, so I'll start just by giving a bit of background on, on this institution. What is the International Seabed Authority? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll look at a little bit at our perspectives on what the problems are uh, with the International Seabed Authority. And then the final and probably most important part of um, what I'd like to say today is about how you, and your organization can influence uh, the International Seabed Authority. So um, just to set the scene a little bit, um, the International Seabed Authority is the body that's in charge of creating the rules and regulations of deep sea mining. It's composed of 167 member states plus the EU, and the whole organization is coordinated by uh, the ISA Secretariat. So the ISA Secretariat is somewhat problematic historically. Um, it's supposed to be neutral and objective, but actually they're very blatantly pushing for deep sea mining to begin as soon as possible. The ISA is a UN, UN affiliated body, but it's not actually part of the UN. So it's kind of accountable to no one, which is you know, something that, that's, that's proved a problem um, in the past. Um, so there are three crucial things to know about the ISA. First and foremost, it has a fundamentally conflicting mandate. It is mandated both to regulate deep sea mining and therefore allow deep sea mining to happen, and also to ensure the protection of the marine environment. Problem is, you can't do both. This is essentially an impossible task. The science is really clear on this. You cannot mine the seabed without causing harm to the marine environment. So another big problem is that there is a, an inherent uh, conflict of interest at the heart of the ISA um, in that it receives money for every mining contract it hands out, which explains this historically uh, pro-mining stance of this institution. Um, and I mean, there are lots of examples of this, but given the limited time, I won't go into too much detail. So I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the third thing that you need to know about the ISA, um, which is the fact that, can we just have the next slide? Thank you. Um, it is riddled with transparency issues. So uh, again, there are lots of examples of this, but I will just refer back to something that, that Nat touched on earlier, which is a very recent example of transparency issues, which was um, the approval of this mining test just a couple of months ago. So the way that this happened was essentially that there was a, a small group of people uh, within the ISA structure that uh, approved the test without consulting or even notifying member states. Um, and basically an email was sent around to this small group saying, you know, if there are no objections within 72 hours, we say yes to the mining test. Um, so they granted approval, um, but this so-called test involves taking up 3,600 tons of nodules, 
that's a lot of nodules. And this is not a test. This is the beginning of deep sea mining. And it's happening right now in the Pacific. Did anybody actively say yes to this? No. And that brings me to the last and most important part of what I'd like to say today, um, which is how can you and your organization actually influence this institution? Well, it's really important to remember that the ISA is its member state, and you can influence the ISA processes via the country that you are working with or from. So for too long, the power has been sitting comfortably in the hands of the ISA secretariat, but it's time for member states, your countries, to take that power back and exercise their rights as political actors in the international system. This is where you come in. Um, so what can you actually do concretely? First and foremost, quite simply, you can write letters uh, to government uh, to raise your concerns and request uh, a meeting. It's better if you're able to actually find out which ministry um, is working with deep sea mining. It's usually either the foreign affairs uh, ministry or the environment ministry. Um, and yeah, we're very happy to provide support and information on this if you need. We do, we do have information um, about, about for certain countries about which ministries are dealing with deep sea mining. So if you are interested in pursuing this kind of action, please by all means get in touch. Um, we have letter models, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really happy to support on, on that kind of thing. The second thing that you can do is get media attention. You know, this is the best thing uh, to do to change a government position is if they feel observed. So press releases, press conferences, social media, interviews, anything like that. Um, so what can you actually ask of your country? Well, there are three top line asks for any country, uh, whether they're council or, or an assembly country. So I should just note here that um, there are kind of two levels of countries at the ISA. There are countries that sit on the council and countries that sit on the assembly. And what your country can do kind of depends on, on what group they're in. However, there are these three top line asks that you can ask of any country. First and most important, you can call on your country to publicly speak out in support of a ban, a moratorium, or a precautionary pause on deep sea mining at the ISA and at other international events, uh, such as at the UNGA or at uh, the Climate Cops or the Biodiversity Cops. Second, uh, you can call on your country to initiate a review and reform of this profoundly problematic institution. So any ISA member state has the right to call for a review process, which if done properly should result in a reform. The third thing that you can ask um, is that your country bans deep sea mining in their territorial waters. Obviously this also would send an extremely strong signal to the international community. Uh, it sends the signal that deep sea mining is not a desirable economic activity. It is not a safe activity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you happen to be working with a council country, um, and in my presentation, there's a, there's a link here to the list of the, the 36 council countries, you can add two extra calls. You can ask your country to vote against the adoption of a mining code. Um, it's important to bear in mind that the adoption of a mining code, no matter how strong, means the beginning of deep sea mining. So, um, in order to adopt this code, it requires consensus from all council members. So all it takes is one country to block that mining code from being adopted. The second thing you can do is ask your country to take preemptive action to block any contracts from being, from being approved next year and in years to come. So that's kind of bringing me to the end of what I wanted to say today, um, but please do get in touch with me um, if you would like uh, some private follow up or a call for more information on, on what you can do within this institutional structure. Um, we have a lot of materials, we have briefings, we have talking points, we have letter templates, etc. Um, but I would just like to end by saying that, you know, as has been highlighted in the other presentations, this is an urgent and immediate threat to the ocean and pivotal decisions will be made next year. And, you know, as Mary Louise 
was hi highlighted earlier, we are talking about potentially the largest mining operation in the history of humankind. So this is really the moment for civil society to stand up and raise their voices and say enough. If we want to stop it, it's now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you to give us very well and good instructions on how we should act and act against the deep sea mining. Um, later, we will present to you with a briefing with all these, uh, with these also some opportunities that Emma mentioned. And also, uh, Emma, your email will be available to everyone as well. And then you can uh, get in touch with Emma and all the speakers, I hope. <laughs> Um, so now we are uh, uh, going for our next uh, present, not next presentation, which is uh, with Juan Evans Pin from Ecologistas de Nación from Spain, and Juan Juan will talk about uh, transformative change, understanding the metal demand. Thanks, Juan. The floor is yours. Shwam, we can't hear you because I think you are connected to the interpretation thing, right? I think that's the problem. Yeah, for those ones that uh, listen to interpretation, uh, Shwam was our interpreter and our speaker as well. <laughs> Can hear you. I can actually. Now it's working. But I'm speaking in yeah. Portuguese now. Now you can hear no, me. Yeah, I just I ended up the interpretation thing. Yeah. Okay, sorry for that. No, it's okay. Okay, so here we go. You can see the the slides also. Yeah. Okay, so we, we talked a, bit, a lot about deep sea mining, and we haven't talked so much about why is this really on the table now? I mean, it's been on the table for a number of, of decades, but only in, in mostly in recent years has this really kind of become a, a, a more pressing issue. And this has to do, of course, with metal demand and metal prices going up. You can think about how costly it is to do mining on land, even in low cost operations in bulk open pit mining. Uh, and of course, mining in the deep sea, one of the bigger issues was, of course, the, the, the economic costs of actually doing such a uh, operation. Now, it's, it's the rising metal prices and the growing demand that has kind of now brought this allegedly into the area of what would be economically feasible, not environmentally, not socially, not in terms of planetary boundaries, but maybe uh, in terms of profits. So this graph you see here is, is for example, the devolution of copper demand uh, over the last century. And you see both the, the trajectory, so the projections for metal demand in, in years to come. And, and just to give you the, the example with copper, uh, most projections are talking about mining as much copper in the next 30 years as we have already mined in the last 7,000 years. So the, the exponential increase in demand of a number of metals and particularly some metal associated with certain technologies is what is somehow driving this demand. So the issue, the real question is demand to do what? And if you think of presentations by metals company and other companies involved with with mining you see a lot of talk about evs electric vehicles and phones and i'll just touch on those two examples today very briefly so with evs there's currently on in the world some uh, 14,000 million uh, vehicles uh, con internal combustion engines and then talk about how to change from internal combustion engines which are extremely problematic to electric vehicles. Uh, and now just to think about what this would mean in terms of metal demand, 
we would be talking about some 340 million tons of lithium batteries, which in turn would require 57 million tons of copper, 51 million tons of nickel, 10 million, million tons of cobalt, and 17 million tons of lithium. So you see some of these metals are the ones that are kind of driving that push towards deep sea mining. If we would add electrifying shipping, it would go up to 790 million tons of lithium batteries, what would be needed. And if you add all, the, up, all this up together, it would exceed the known uh, reserves for nickel and, and cobalt. So the demand is larger than what the, 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 the amount of metals which are actually available to extract, and then it would fully deplete lithium reserves. So this is just the general picture. But the real question is, what, what is it? Why, we, why do we want to do this? Now, EVs as just conventional combustion, internal combustion engines are parked most of the time. They spend 95% of their time parked. Most of the energy is used to, to move the vehicle itself, which weighs one or two tons and maybe one or two people inside them. So it's a, it's a, mass, it's a colossal use of energy just for uh, you know, moving one or two people, which is the usual uh, use, and then mostly to be used in short distances where we don't really need cars, where we could use alternative means of transportation. Most families, most people are, are losing by ha owning, their, owning their own car instead of going to other forms of, of uh, using um, cars. And then there's the issue of traffic congestion. So this is what we're thinking of doing deep sea mining for. If we think of phones, uh, there's double the phones in the planet that there is people. There's 15,000 million phones in the world. Most of these are thrown away, turned to rubbish in just two years. That's the average. And if you think of Europe alone, it's once 160 million phones go to waste every year. Again, cobalt, one of those minerals that are big in terms of justifying the hunt for nodules and cobalt rich crusts. Uh, one of the uh, main uses of, of cobalt is, uh, is uh, phone production. About 20% of cobalt is directed to just to, to phones. And although cell phones and other electronic devices potentially are up to 80 or maybe even more, uh, more of the metal content can be recycled, the fact is this is not happening. And nine out of 10 phones are either incinerated or dumped in landfills. And this is so even when a, a typical uh, smartphone has 100 times more gold or tungsten than a, a high grade mine. So you have more concentration of valuable metals in electronic waste than you have in conventional mines and, and, and in the deep sea. And the other interesting issue about recycling is how uh, it's 13 times cheaper to extract copper or gold or other metals from electronic waste than it is to uh, mine it from conventional mines on, on land and even many times more than it would be to do it on sea. So the question is, uh, what is the sense of mining more both on land and in sea in the face of this uh, massive colossal waste and how we're dissipating these metals into the environment at scales which are irresponsible. Now, in terms of alternatives, I would just like to suggest a few, and then maybe I point you to some resources where these are discussed in more detail. The first, of course, is to what likely upon Earth. Uh, rethink how we're using metals, rethink uh, how, you know, what kind of demand our ways of consuming and producing are is driving and if in many areas, so the, in, in terms of transport, this involves rethinking mobility. Why does everybody have to have their own electric vehicle with that, uh, you know, with that kind of ownership and use of private cars being such a, a critical factor in, in, in driving um, uh, metal demand or ownership, not just of cars, but many other things where, um, using goods or services could be could be a, a solution. Uh, this also has to do with how we not only use, but how we design um, products for repairability. So instead of those two years of life for a, a cell phone, why not design them so they can be repairable, so they can have long lives? How uh, 
spare parts can then be reused and how at the end of their life, um, these products can be easily recyclable. Most uh, products are now um, under recycled precisely because of the faults that have to do with design. Prioritizing secondary metals. So instead of continuing to mine more and more, why don't we really try to tap into all those metals that have already been extracted over the past 7,000 years and that are available and are buried in different places or in landfills or uh, in our drawers at home. If you think of all the, the, the phones that are stacked in drawers, why not tap into that potential? And then really rethink resource governance, both in terms of global justice and the North, of course, the global North is hoarding all these resources coming from, from the global South, but also in terms of intergenerational. So in terms of you know, how much will there be available for future generations? With, and um, I'm running out of time. So first, uh, le let me say this is already happening. We're talking about a moratorium, a ban, a precautionary pause. Many countries and territories around the world have already taken this step on land, for example, and also in, on, on sea, thinking here of the Northern Territory in Australia. But many countries uh, have already banned either open pit mining or all, me all metal mining, given the impact that this activity has on land. And these are courageous com countries that have, uh, you know, walked those first steps and I think are efforts to bring about a, a ban, a moratorium or a pause to deep sea mining has a lot to learn from these past experiences of, of, uh, of change and, and learning there could be another way. Finally, uh, some of the data and the, and the information I, I, I've just mentioned are available in Breaking Free from Mining, a report by Seas at Risk. So if you would like to go deeper into some of the things I mentioned, you can download it. It's also available in Spanish. And um, you'll find a, a, another way of, of rethinking really how, how metal demand is working and driving this push for, for deep sea mining. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Juan. Very, very illustrative. Um, so I think uh, we are running out of time. Now we have a last uh, quiz, I think, Anna. It's the yeah. quiz question. Yeah. Could you maybe stop sharing the, the screen? Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, so we have one last question. I hope that these this presentations were, were, you know, enough to keep you interested and to, to keep you fighting the good fight. So let's see if you can see. Yeah, I think you can. So our final question, and before the last presentation, which was, is going to be done by Tiago, is how much do you, how much, how much optimism do you feel regarding the deep sea? Uh, protection, not deep sea mining, obviously. Um, how much do you think? Can you see it? Okay. She's not moving, so I don't know why it's not working. I'm I. I think I am going to try to share it again with nothing in the end because this is not, yeah, no, nothing's happening. Can I do it in the end? Yeah? Yeah, this is kind of blocked, I don't know why. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Just wait the, yeah, yeah. Just wait the end to do it. Okay, so can I start? Can I start? Uh, the so the question. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so I just want to share a, a small story with you just before but, the yeah, end and Chiago, before you, are, you answer the. Tiago, we are we are seeing the presentation mode, not the presentation itself. We we can see. I don't know. Can you see the presentation now? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So 
Can I stop? Go ahead. No, we still see your notes. I don't know what's happening. We see your notes. Is that better or? Yeah, now we don't see the notes yet. <laughs> okay. So I just want to, to give you, um, well, a little uh, uh, witness story. So, um, thank, well, thanks for Nata for organizing the web workshop. And um, well, just in June 2022, the United Nations Ocean Conference uh, in Lisbon was um, really not supposed to be about deep sea mining. Um, it was a week for networking and sharing best practices in the fields of ocean conservation. And the final declaration was already settled from the start and did not include deep sea mining protection, deep sea protection objectives. So, however, uh, thanks to global mobilization, so you can see the picture here with uh, Richard's uh, Rise of Bus, <laughs> uh, standing for uh, uh, deep sea, uh, so for ocean protection. And so there was Portuguese citizens rallying up with some of the youth from all corners of the world. Uh, some of us, some of them are here with us today and also NGOs from, well, all continents. And thus deep sea mining was nailed in the agenda of the UN Ocean Conference and even became trend to, uh, the trendy topic of the week. So I remember uh, Adam was defending deep at the We are, we are, I think I, at least me, I'm losing you, Thiago. Okay. Is that yeah. I can, I can, see you, I can see you moving better on Emma's computer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, Let's yeah. do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, yeah, you we were here on the, um, on the Youth Ocean Conference. And yeah, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition was no stranger um, to the building of this momentum. So you, you saw Emma's presentation just, uh, just before that. And um, you had Emma and lots of other people running everywhere, rallying, well, champion countries on the, the Monday for a global moratorium. So on the Monday, we, you had uh, Palau, Fiji, Samoa, and also the federal, well, after that, the federal state of Micronesia joining uh, the moratorium. But on Tuesday, uh, the confirmation that the, mo the, the momentum was alive really became tangible. Um, so the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition partnered um, with uh, champions such as a uh, French member of the U European Parliament, Marie Toussaint, and MP uh, Debbie Na um, Na Narewa Packer from Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, to ignite a new global parliamentary declaration calling for a moratorium on deep sea bale mining. And today, well, thanks to this uh, movement, we have 248 uh, total signatures, 141 men, uh, 107 women, and uh, from more than 50 countries all around the world. So this is just to show you how, um, well, uh, NGOs and uh, people rallying up can uh, act and uh, change things uh, deep sea mining wise. And now Renate uh, wanted to share something with you. We cannot, we cannot hear you, Renate. You're on mute now. I was, I was on mute. Uh, so thank you, Tiago. Uh, you are ready to pass to the next slide, and thank you very much. Actually, uh, I should have said uh, before Tiago starts that the, this part of the presentation is called How Can We Act Together? Uh, so Tiago was uh, talking about this uh, moratorium uh, that happened during the UNOC, and now I wanted to present to you what can you do now, and you say you can say no, to deep sea mining, just uh, pointing your phone to the screen of your computer, and then you will uh, scan this QR code and will open directly the only one petition that uh, it's a civil society petition that you can uh, sign up 
to join this uh, petition to say no to deep sea mining. So far, I think there are more than 5,000, uh, eight, eight, 5,000 uh, registr uh, registrations or signatures for the petition. And uh, it will be great if you want to share in your uh, social media as well, that we can have more and more because uh, more in this case, it's better. Um, and then, then uh, after this, I will pass again to Tiago. After you, I don't know if you have the time to sign up. I hope, yes. I don't think it's, uh, it take, take a long, takes a long time, but it, this will be also in the briefing document we will send to you anyway, but if you can do it, uh, better. Tiago, it's with you. Yes. Anyway, we'll be sharing all this information and content with you on a future briefing. Uh, along with, well, many other information. And we really want your feedback. We'll be sharing with you um, well, a formula that you did. You, 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 we'll be sharing with you. And well, just to, to, to end, we've got, you've got lots of tools, lots of instruments that have been created by all yeah. the NGOs, all the citizens around the world. You have um, moratorium, moratorium that you ask uh, that you can ask your governments to join. You have got civil society protests and petitions. Companies have also joined uh, the global call for moratorium, as as well as the scientists. Some journalists are really doing their, their well, uh, well heavy lifting job to uh, get this information out in the public. So this is a link to the to the, to the briefing that I'll present you. Um, Tiago, I think it was a bit difficult to to hear you now in the last time, but thank you very much. Um, and here in this slide, you can uh, see that we here, if you uh, click, maybe uh, someone could would add this to the question and answer so everyone could uh, directly click and enter. But this is a briefing document that we prepare to everyone. Uh, here you can find uh, how you can be more engaged and working on deep sea mining. Uh, there is a lot of information about deep sea mining, all kinds of petitions that we are aware of, like uh, to uh, in signatures or, or the moratorium. So there you can access uh, petitions for civil society, parliamentarians, uh, businesses, and others. Uh, we also prepared a general press release about the, the deep sea mining and this webinar that you can use in your region to encourage media, as Emma was saying, that we need to encourage media attention about this topic. Um, you just need to enter in the press release, which is inside this document, uh, and change the yellow part, uh, add, add your name and the name of your organization, and then send to the press media. Uh, so as this part, it's also how we can act. Uh, we prepare this, but also we need your collaboration for that. Uh, and then we would like to create uh, uh, a call to action to stop deep sea mining. Uh, and I would like to invite you to contribute to that. Uh, and then when you access the do this document, you can see that you can suggest a tweet that we could all use together to stop deep sea mining. And the last, but very, very important, it, there is another QR code that you can see in your screen. And this QR code goes to a Google form where we have some questions about deep sea mining. And how do we, these questions or this questionnaire is in Portuguese, Spanish, uh, por, uh, French and English. So uh, please uh, answer and share with everyone else in your, in your organization, groups, uh, friends uh, that you might consider would be uh, interested to know more and to be more close to this uh, growing movement of uh, against deep sea mining. And with this, 
that's, I think we finished our presentations for today. I would like to thank you everyone very much and ask if we have some uh, questions and answers to answer now uh, from the pool. Everyone that has any question, please feel free to add if it is already, uh, if it's not answered yet. I don't know, uh, let me see. Uh, so uh, I I think uh, it's already answered the difference between moratorium. Yeah, yeah, we we managed to, and Marie Louise and Natalie were were during the session were answering um, in in writing to to all of these questions. So again, thank you, Tiago and Emma. We are just finishing also. So uh, if anyone has further questions. Please do not hesitate to uh, contact us, or maybe uh, Marie Louise or Natalie. I'm so I'm sure that they will be they will be willing to respond, and even for uh, Schwam and Chile. So if you need any of any any further information, let us know. I think we can close. Thank you so much for being here and for bearing with us, even with all the techn technical and you know virtual problems that that arise from using zoom so much but i think it was a very very interesting webinar thank you again so much for giving it for giving us such uh, uh complete presentations i think we are all much more better informed about this now Nata, i don't know if you want to say anything else um just uh yeah just thank you very much everyone as well uh please uh get in touch with us uh, uh enter the for the the briefing document uh, there you also have information in different languages we are uh, uh we are trying or we, we want to translate also this presentation to other languages along with the uh, video that uh, natalie showed a bit of uh before the blue period video uh, so if you are interested as well uh, to have more information in other languages, please contact us. I know it's difficult um, to, to have information in all the languages, but we are, we are going to try. Uh, and please um, answer our Google Forms and thank you very, very much for the participation of everyone. We will record the recordings we will send again to everyone as well. Bye. Thanks. Obrigado. Obrigada. Obrigada, Obrigada Shirley. <laughs>